Welcome, everyone. We acknowledge the land on which McMaster University was built. It's the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, many of whom continue to live and work here today. The territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties, and it's within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this gathering place is home to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. Thank you so much, Naomi Klein, for joining us virtually tonight at the Wilson Institute for Canadian History. And I should acknowledge the generous support we've received from the Future of Canada Project, which has funded our Syndemic series, the McMaster's Faculty of Humanities, which sustains our institute. This is the last public Zoom meeting in the series, and it's great to have it end on such a high note. After I've posed my questions, we shall select a few from the audience members. You can present them using the chat function on YouTube. <clears throat> and I should also say that Syndemic Magazine, our online product, has come out with its first issue just two days ago. And our first issue is dedicated to neoliberalism and the pandemic with, for instance, Micah Jorgensen offering reflections on forest fires in BC and the pandemic close to themes that Naomi Klein has raised so powerfully. Since no logo in 1999, Naomi has been a must read for everybody interested in how our planet and its peoples have been transformed by neoliberal capitalism. The shock doctrine 2007 focused on how in conditions of socioeconomic turmoil, elites are able to implement far reaching plans that seem to be responses to crisis, but in fact work to secure their own narrow interests. This changes everything, capitalism versus the climate 2014 picked up this theme, emphasizing how a neoliberal order was in effect, and I quote, now at war with many forms of life on earth, including human life. A theme echoed fairly directly, I have to say, by Pope Francis in his most recent encyclical. No is not enough resisting the new shock politics and winning the world we need, 2017, emphasizes the need for progressives both to speak, break free from the forces that lock them into the reigning economic paradigm, but also to enunciate a positive vision of the world we might create. And Naomi has recently brought out a book aimed at a younger audience, How to Change Everything, The Young Human's Guide to Protecting the Planet and Each Other, 2021. On Fire, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal, 2020, her seventh major book focuses closely on climate change as a, and I quote, civilizational crisis one that calls into question humankind's commitment to growth at any price. So my questions tonight will focus a lot on that title and on Naomi's recent pandemic journalism. So the warmest of welcomes, Naomi Klein. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ian. I'm thrilled to be with you. And welcome everyone, wherever you are. I'm speaking to you from unceded Shishat territory uh, in uh, Whale Kwai, British Columbia, also known as Half Moon Bay on the Sunshine Coast. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so first, as I prepped for this interview, I reread many of my voluminous notes on your work and was struck by both the continuities and changes within it. To what extent, your conservative critics ask, is your entire movement simply a green Trojan horse whose belly is full of, and I quote, red Marxist socioeconomic doctrine, or green is the new red, complains one of Margaret Thatcher's closest collaborators. Do these critics have a point? Would it be accurate to discern in your work a growing emphasis on critiquing capitalism as an economic system? Can you offer us your own description of your intellectual journey from no logo to how to change everything? <laughs> 
Well, I can try. <laughs> um, you know, I definitely see continuities uh, um, between my books in the sense that I kind of follow my research where it leads me. Um, and, 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 you know, e each book ends me at a certain place and then it becomes a little bit unsatisfying and I end up trying to resolve the contradictions of the last book. I think you can sort of see that most clearly in the, in, the, in the relationship between the shock doctrine and this changes everything in the sense that the shock doctrine is about a right-wing strategy um, of exploiting states of shock in, and a, as an anti-democratic tool and having ideas lying around. And when, we, when I released the shock doctrine in 2007, we had a little <clears throat> film that went with it that, that we produced with Alfonso Cuaron and the slogan of that film was information is shock resistance, arm yourselves. And so I think I had this sort of arrogant idea that if we understood this tactic that these very unpopular policies get smuggled in under cover of crisis, then just knowing that would be armor uh, against this cynical tactic. Um, but as I said, that was 2007 and in 2008, the financial crisis happened and and a lot of people understood that that crisis was being exploited in order to further enrich elites and to push through privatization and deregulation. And the slogan on the streets of Europe was, we, won't, we will not pay for your crisis, but they did pay for the crisis of the bankers. Um, and I think puzzling through why it was that despite the fact that we knew that that crisis was being exploited in order to deepen the agenda that had produced that crisis, is what made me start thinking about, well, we, you know, as, as the title of another of my books, No is Not Enough. It's not enough just to say no to their bad ideas. We need our own crisis strategies. We need, to, we need our own solutions to crisis. And so that's what kind of set me off on the journey to write This Changes Everything, which is a, 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 an answer, because I've never argued that we don't need answers to crises. We do, um, we don't, we need to, we, that doesn't mean we need to exploit them cynically to smuggle in our agenda. It means that we need solutions on the scale of the crises. Um, and, and, and that is what I think a Green New Deal is. That is what I think, um, you know, a systemic response to the climate crisis is. And so that's the argument I made and this changes everything. But I think um, another way of seeing and uh, a way in which my ideas progressed is that the first few books that I wrote were really critiques of neoliberal capitalism. Um, no Logo was, uh, mm. The Shock Doctrine was an alternative history of how we ended up with neoliberalism around the world or um, this, uh, um, you know, this, th this extreme form of capitalism, um, uh, uh, you know, it's gone by many names. Um, and I, and I make an argument for, the, for, for, I think, an under, at that time, an under-theorized role that shocks and crises played in advancing the neoliberal revolution. Um, when I set off to write This Changes Everything, I thought that that was also going to be a book about neo, like a class between neoliberalism and capitalism. But as you quoted um, in your very kind introduction, Ian, um, the book doesn't only talk about the neoliberal stage of capitalism and how that is at war with life on earth. It talks about the growth imperative at the heart of capitalism, neoliberal or Keynesian. And um, although Keynes argued for a steady state. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, in following my research, it became clear to me that it, this was not just a, a clash between, between neoliberalism um, but, the, but the growth imperative itself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and another aspect of that is that in state, it, it centralized state socialisms, different, you know, quote, socialisms in quote, it, because I think there's definitely a strong argument to be had about whether or not that really was socialism in the Soviet Union, but that was also at war with life on earth. And I think that, that that's important to acknowledge as well. Um, so a long answer to your very <laughs> good question, I hope. What, what just would you say to the Trojan horse uh, charge? Um, that, that we're green on the outside and red on the inside? <laughs> we're all red on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what I would say, Ian, is, um, is, is that my, like the, the, the 
the art, the, the research that I did that led to writing No Logo was about the ways in which capitalism sacrifices um, both both workers and ecologies to pursue short term growth. And you know, my, I, I, that book, a few of its um, examples were the sweatshops producing our sort of disposable consumer goods, but also the Niger Delta and, and what Shell had done there. It, it wasn't a book that was engaging with climate change specifically, but it was, uh, it, it was engaging with localized ecological sacrifice zones. And the argument at the time that you would hear from boosters of neoliberalism in the 90s was, okay, yes, you know, th these places are being polluted and these people are working under terrible conditions, but eventually it's going to lead to so much growth um, and, and so much prosperity that the benefits are just going to trickle down and everybody will, will, will you know, all, uh, a rising tide will lift all boats. In fact, what has happened is that the sacrifice zones uh, of the capitalist project have just expanded from those lo localized impacts of the places where they said, well, these places don't count to the planet itself. Um, and so I think that you know, I'm not trying to hide anything. I mean, I really have a critique of capitalism that extends from the local to the global. And I think that, you know, that quote from Thatcher's former chancellor, um, Nigel Lawson, it's not coincidental that it comes from the man who shepherded in, you know, the there is no alternative and privatization and deregulation, because he is the one who has an ideology that he is, is so incapable of squaring with the reality of what is happening with our planet, that he has become one of the major climate change deniers in the world, because you can't believe in privatization and deregulation and growth at all costs, and also acknowledge what is happening with, you know, with, with our planet's life support systems. Oh, thank you. Uh, moving along to my second question, along with Andreas Mom, who was an earlier guest on Syndemic, you enunciate what you call an inconvenient truth i.e. there is no time for gradualism. As you write, when you have gone off as badly off course as we have, moderate actions don't lead to moderate outcomes. They lead to dangerously radical ones. Do you agree with mom that as COP26 seemingly illustrated in late 2021, the many international conferences have essentially failed? And now humanity requires a much more militant environmental movement. Or as you put it brilliantly, and this changes everything, and I quote, the only thing rising faster than our emissions is the output of words pledging to lower them. So how in the 2020s do we build opposition movements able to do more than burn bright and burn out in your words? Can the momentum of 2019 be regained? So, yeah, I do agree with myself and I agree <laughs> with Andreas, <laughs> you know, in the sense that, you know, I was reading some of the reports after COP26, the, the conference of the parties, the parties to um, the, the, the UN Climate Convention. And, 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 and everybody acknowledged that it was completely inadequate. But you, you, you saw these headlines like it was a good start. And I think if you find yourself saying that something is a good start and that something is called COP26, <laughs> as in it has happened 26 years in a row, um, there's something badly, <laughs> you know, amiss, right? This, we're not at the starting point. We are 26 COPs in, right? Okay. And if we're still patting ourselves on the back for our little tiny little, 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 little gains, um, even as the impacts are no longer, you know, off in the distance, but are banging down the doors. I mean, I'm speaking to you from, from BC, and it's just hard to describe to folks who are not on the West Coast what we've lived through in these past months. And, it, you know, I, I, I think that we are not on, on we are not the most vulnerable uh, climate uh, um, you know, geography, certainly Pacific Islands are more impacted, certainly the Arctic is more impacted, um, you know, certainly parts of Africa are more impacted. But when it comes to North America, what we've been living with these staccato climate events um, from the heat dome in June, when this was the deadliest weather event in Canadian history, 600 people died in a week, 
the estimates are now that 10 billion marine creatures died and the reverberations of that are still being tracked, you know, by some of my colleagues at UBC, right? Because these were, um, you know, mussels and, and clams and, and, and barnacles, and this is the food of the, of the seabirds. So we don't know yet what happens to those birds when 10 billion creatures die in a week, right? Um, and then comes the atmospheric river and we're learning all these new words like pineapple express and heat dome. And I mean, it's just, it's just been extraordinary. Um, and so, so yeah, we don't need a good start. <laughs> we need transformative action. And I think the question is, it, it, there's no doubt that our movements have failed to produce it. It's not just the cop that has failed. We've all failed. Now, I, you know, I, I, I don't know that I agree with, with, uh, with Andreas that what the missing piece is sabotage, as he's been arguing. I mean, what I have argued is that we've never had the kind of broad-based movement that can, that, that can shut down cities the way the truckers are shutting them down right now. Um, I, you know, I think our movement needs to become broader. I think it needs to become more militant in the sense of general strikes. Um, I think um, we, you know, you talked about re regaining the momentum of 2019. I think the student youth, youth strikes were incredible, but you, you, youth strikes were never going to be enough. It's always, you know, the, the slogan of the, of the 2014 climate um, march was to change everything. It takes everybody. And we've never really had the full, like a, a really broad uh, coalition of social movements truly engaged and the missing piece frankly more than any other has been labor has been organized labor um, there are different there are some trade unions that have really thrown down but most of the large trade unions have had a much more ambivalent relationship around uh, um, with with the kind of transformational climate action that we really do need um, and you know the hopes of something like a green new deal is that the job creation potential and attaching measures like uh, you know a, 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 um, a wage guarantee, a benefits guarantee, a jobs guarantee, that this can be enough to capture the imagination um, of, of workers and their representatives that they will fight for it. I, I don't think it is just going to be a vanguard that's going to win the kind of transformation that we need. That's a great segue into the third question, which is your new book about a teenage you know, for a teenage audience. And I was wondering if that perhaps reflected your sense that it is the young who stand a chance of really transforming the world. So On Fire has a lot on Greta Thunberg and her gift for unvarnished truth-telling while also reflecting on the besuited bureaucrats who, and I quote from you, clapped and filmed her on their smartphones as if she were a novelty act. Hers was a transnational youth movement in 2019 with perhaps 2,000 youth climate strikes in 125 countries with a 1.6 million young people joining in. And then came the pandemic and what seemed a movement ready to take on the world really went into reverse. Does this recent history and perhaps earlier ones from the 60s or the 80s illustrate both the strengths but also maybe some of the limitations of a generational emphasis. And that yes, the contradictions of the system seem glaring to young eyes, yet youth is fleeting. Young people are especially vulnerable to what you call a powerful sense of doom. And our system seems quite capable of deflecting even so staunch a champion as Thunberg. Do we need something more than a multitude of grassroots movements led by the young and is it even fair to ask young people to bear this planet saving burden well i'll start with the last part of that you know i think really important question first which is um you know is it fair it's not fair <laughs> and i've you know in 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 championing this extraordinary youth movement um i I'm very, very clear that my generation and generations older than me um, and, and in between my generation and, and the youth strikers, um, we all have to get involved and we all need our, uh, we all need to do our parts. You know, I was very, I was very, um, uh, one of my, one of, one of my uh, minor claims to fame, Ian, is that I sent on fire 
to, uh, to, to Jane Fonda when it was still in galleys. And her response was to go get herself arrested every week, you know, um, <laughs> out, uh, uh, in Washington, precisely because I think the message is very clear that, it, that young people are taking extraordinary risks. Um, and, and they are not saying, we've got this. They're saying, show up with us, do your part. Um, and we all have pieces in this ecosystem. I think, it, you, I think there's no re possible replacement for youth energy, um, uh, in the, uh, but we need intergenerational movements. You know, one of the most um, powerful movements I've been a part of um, in recent years was against the Dakota Access Pipeline. And when I was at Standing Rock, um, I was, it was, it was, what was most striking to me was that it was the most intergenerational movement space than I'd, that I'd ever been in, that there really was a role for everybody. Um, and, and I think we, we have to, we have to take that lesson and coming back to what I said earlier about the role of workers and trade mm -hmm. unions, it really does take everyone, but I think it's too soon to sort of talk about the youth climate movement in the past tense. I have to push back a little bit on that. I think young people have had a tough pandemic. Um, as we all have, but I think it's been particularly hard for young people to cope with the isolation and just the difficulty of organizing and just the weight of the pandemic on top of the climate crisis. And there's a lot of grief, um, but I believe that this generation is gonna be able to get their fire back. Um, and that, you know, I have a lot of faith in spring. <laughs> <laughs> Um, on. <laughs> yes. Um, but one thing I would just say about Greta that I love is, you know, there is there is a new version of Greta that we saw in Glasgow, which is the, the blah, blah, blah Greta. Right. <laughs> um, which is her response to all of those selfies and all of the sort of the way in which she was paraded around and sort of invited in this weird kind of tell us how bad we are. I don't know, like some sort of political s and like come and tell us how we're failing and we'll all get our pictures taken with you. And she completely turned the table on these leaders and, 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 and refused to play that role of the innocent, you know, at pleading with leaders to please this time really listen to her and just mocks them mercilessly um, all of their pledges and just said it's, you know, and, and I think her blah, blah, blah speech is sort of the greatest piece of oratory, you know, of, in, 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 certainly that I've seen from her, but potentially that I've seen in 20 years, I think it will be studied. It is so brilliant, right? The way she snuck in on them and where they, at first they thought she was praising her, right? So they were kind of clap, clapping as she says, build back better. And then she says, blah, 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 green economy, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then says, you know, you're not going to save us. We are going to save us, right? Um, and I think that this is a turning point. I think this generation now understands that it isn't going to be the perfect speech to the to the EU or to you know the UN that's going to suddenly make these leaders see the light. It's really about building outside power. Um, and uh, and and so yeah, I don't think this uh, the story is still being written. I believe <laughs> your pandemic journalism underlines the message of the shock doctrine, asking whether all the computer facilitated discipline that we've been subjected to over the past two years will be constrained by democratic oversight. Or, and I quote you, will it be rolled out in a state of exception frenzy without asking critical questions that will shape our lives for decades to come? You theorize that the pandemic has been grasped by corporations as a quote, living laboratory for the permanent and highly profitable no touch future, which you ironically term the screen new deal. Public schools, universities, hospitals are facing existential questions about their futures, you write. Well before COVID-19, Silicon Valley had an agenda of replacing so many of our personal body experiences by inserting technology in the middle of them. In our years of COVID-19, a principal driver of this transformation has been the state. Now, does that complicate a narrative that since No Logo has focused intently on how corporations are transforming our lives? And in Canada, especially, say over the last two days, hasn't the state also revealed itself to be quite capable of its own shock doctrines? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it, I, I, 
I think it has always been a kind of corporatist collaboration between the state and 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 large multinational corporations. Um, you you always need that kind of partnership if you're going to change laws. Um, and you know what I describe in the shock doctrine are governments working at the behest uh, of large corporations. And so if we look at that, you know, the piece that you talked about, this Green New Deal piece, you know, I was reporting on. Um, uh, then New York Governor Cuomo collaborating with uh, Google's Eric Schmidt and Michael Bloomberg and Bill Gates, you know, to to reimagine New York State. Now, thankfully, Cuomo is no longer governor, and you know, some of his plans were organized labor was able to push back on some of the plans that they were trying to rush through. Like, you know, Cuomo was giving speeches at that time, going. Why do we even need classrooms? Why do we even need teachers? You know, and so it was, um, it was uh, similar to what happened after hurricanes that I've reported on, like after Hurricane Katrina, when when the, when the school system was radically reinvented, um, it became a laboratory for the charter school system. Same thing happened after Hurricane Maria, where they closed hundreds of schools in Puerto Rico, and um, and and reversed a law that, that, that banned charter schools. <clears throat> During COVID, we're seeing something quite different where, and you know, to be honest with you, it's been a little tricky for me because I did write a book about how governments exploit states of emergencies. I do believe we are seeing that, but, uh, but we also are at a time of sort of peak conspiracy theory and misinformation, right? So a lot of my ideas are being put into like a bananas blender, right? And it's like they're being um, sort of used and abused a little bit um, and, it, 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 and being taken places where they really don't belong. So they're being used by people who are denying that COVID is real, you know, like I don't like Bill Gates, but I don't, I don't like Bill Gates because Bill Gates, you know, is, has, has way too much influence over public health. Bill Gates has interfered uh, it, uh, to protect the patents of drug companies um, to keep, to, you know, to keep uh, um, vaccines that should be available to everyone on earth. Um, uh, you know, from being distributed. And those vaccines should be available because they were funded with public money. And Bill Gates has intervened to say, no, no, no Pfizer should keep their, their patents and, and, and Moderna should keep their patents. You know, so he's played a really terrible role. Um, but there are lots of people who are out there claiming that Bill Gates, you know, is doing all this because he wants to depopulate the earth and the vaccines have tracking devices. And so it's become like the, the, the tidal wave of misinformation in the context of COVID it's a bit of a new ball game. Like I've always seen conspiracies. Conspiracies are always part of disaster eco, like like ecosystems. So like after after Katrina, when you had this kind of disaster opportunism that I call the shock doctrine, it was so convenient for the rich in in New Orleans. It was so convenient for people who wanted to quote unquote clear out the public housing and gentrify New Orleans that you had conspiracies that surged that said, well, maybe they blew up the levees to do this on purpose. I heard the same thing when I was covering the Asian tsunami where it was so convenient to real estate developers who seized the beaches from the small boat fishing people that people started saying that the whole tsunami was caused by an underground nuclear weapons explosion by the United States. And they did the whole thing so that they could, you know, military, have military occupation. But, but these things didn't go totally viral in the way that the pandemic conspiracies go viral. I, I, I wish I could see like the YouTube comments because I bet people are going, you know, <laughs> bonkers under there claiming that I've, like when I go online now, I see all these people saying Naomi Klein has been, should read her own book because doesn't she realize that, you know, this is the whole COVID is an example of a shock doctrine. So it's not, but what's actually happening is that these, so first I just want to say, Ian, I, I believe that what Trudeau has done is uh, um, very dangerous. And I do not believe that we needed a state of emergency to deal with the truckers. They had lots of warning. They chose to do nothing. We've got a huge problem with the police and the, and the problem with the precedent of, of, of invoking a state of emergency because it's bad for the economy is, what does that mean for the trade union movement? And by the way, where is the trade union movement on this? Um, you know, what, is this, what does this mean for indigenous rights protesters? Like this is a terrible, terrible precedent, okay? Um, it didn't need to happen. Um, we knew the truckers were coming 
and they basically gave them a free pass and then they take the most extreme measure, right? The, the one that has the potential to be most damaging to us. I wanna be very clear that I'm not in favor of that. But I also wanna be very clear that this, what is going on now with, am I allowed to swear? <laughs> Because Steve Bannon, this what we are living through is Steve Bannon's strategy that he described to Michael Lewis as flood the zone with shit. He, this is a quote from Steve Bannon. He is making people that the strategy is to make people doubt any kind of like like the hand in front of their face. So you you don't you don't believe anything at all. And if you don't believe if nothing is true, then anything is possible. It creates a very very malleable political moment for for people to exploit. And what's interesting about the anti-mask, anti-vax crowd, right, is that in the U.S., they've provided incredible cover to the people who want to privatize the school system. So this same thing that I have covered after Katrina, after Maria, is happening in Arizona, in Florida. But now what the wedge is, is, well, if you don't want your kid to go to school with a mask, you should be able to get, have money to spend that money. To, you should be able to get a voucher, which is the same thing that they asked for after Katrina, the same thing they asked for after Hurricane Maria. Parents should be able to get vouchers so that their kids don't have to go to schools that are either doing remote learning or you know, requiring vaccines or masks, and they should be able to spend that money in private schools. So they're using it in the same way they use every single disaster to wage war in public education because they don't believe in public education. But now they're not just using the pandemic, they're using the misinformation about the pandemic. It's a whole new kind of shock doctrine. Um, and yeah, sorry about that rant, but I haven't had the chance to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it might be a book for you. <laughs> I am writing the book. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to hear it. One major thrust of left discourse in the pandemic has been that many more such calamities lie in our future because capitalism has fundamentally disrupted humankind's metabolism with the natural world. So we think of deforestation, frenzied infrastructure construction, the uprooting of vast peasant populations and their relegation to a planet of slums, all along with global climate change. These have all since the 1970s meant that we've been living in an age of pandemics, as geographer Mike Davis and epidemiologist Rob Wallace have argued. Now, I don't sense that this would be a message dramatically out of line with your lifetime of research and writing. Yet apart from one passage in On Fire, this line of inquiry is not really a prominent feature of your work. And this changes everything you write that the climate change is delivering a quote, powerful message spoken in the language of fires, floods, droughts, and extinctions. Would you consider it a friendly or unfriendly amendment to add pandemics to that list of calamities? Well, I'd hesitate to call the pandemics friendly, um, but I would certainly agree that they belong on the list. Mm -hmm. um, and and yeah, I think it's, some, it, it, it's an area that I have not written about enough. I mean, I have, have uh, had a little bit in the shock doctrine about the disaster, the, the, um, the Tamiflu profiteering that, that went on under the, the Bush administration, um, because this was where Donald Rumsfeld worked. D Donald Rumsfeld, before he became Secretary of Defense, was CA CEO of Gilead. Um, and so he was kind of in the business of producing the key responses to pandemics. And so this became one of, one of the examples of disaster profiteering that I documented uh, in, in the shock doctrine. And I did add a new forward to uh, the paperback of On Fire about, about, about COVID. Um, and we made a little film that we talked about showing a little clip of. So um, some of you, some of you watching may, may have seen a film that Avi Lewis, my partner, and I and Molly Crabapple made with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, a few years ago called Message from the Future. Um, uh, and with it with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez that told the story set from 
the standpoint of a, of, of a couple decades into the future of how we want a Green New Deal. And during the pandemic, we started thinking about doing a, a sequel to that. Um, and some of you may have seen this, although few, fewer people saw this because it came out right before the US election. So it was a little bit, um, got a little bit lost in the shuffle, but called a uh, message from the future to the years of repair, thinking about the pandemic as a kind of a message and, and specifically, um, and we, and we developed this film with, um, with, with Opal Tometi, whose voice you'll hear, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter. Um, and the, 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 the concept was, what if COVID is a teacher? And this, this came from some of the research in Puerto Rico where, 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 where folks in Puerto Rico often talked about Hurricane Maria as an unveiling um, or as a teacher that was sort of showing everything that was already broken before the hurricane. And so that was the sort of frame that we used for like, what, what if we learned the lessons that are being exposed right now in how we rebuild when we finally come out of this? Um, so yeah, maybe we can show like the first three minutes of it because it's a 10 minute piece. We could, um, and uh, you'll, you'll hear Opal's voice and then um, Gael Garcia Bernal's voice. Can we roll that? Looking back, it's hard to believe that we've rebuilt our community from the ground up with our own hands. The first seeds were planted way back in the terror and tenderness of the pandemic. And then change bloomed in the streets, in the fire and struggle of the uprisings. Around here, we'll never forget the day that the last prisoners were released, walking out into the arms of their loved ones. The easy part was finding work. The Community Care Corps was always looking for people in those days, whether for universal family care, burying border walls, or green new public housing going up one pod at a time. Yep, it was a good time for busy hands. Funny, thinking back to the first wave of the pandemic, that's what you really remember. Hands. Washing, scrubbing, disinfecting, washing again. Picturing each other's hands. All the hands that had touched whatever we were touching. The hands that packed the box, that picked the tomato, that planted the seed. The hands that stroked the brow, that said goodbye. The hands were us. All of us. That web of hand to hand breath-to-breath -breath relationships was a reminder. We are all entangled, making each other sick, keeping each other alive. That was just one of the lessons of COVID-19. It started in the first great pause, when the smog cleared and the rich fled the cities, when poverty dropped its disguise and racist inequality drew the map of the disease. As the roar of the traffic faded, we arose to birdsong and ambulance sirens. The virus showed us what was truly essential. And we learned again and again that so many of us doing essential work were being treated as sacrificial. From nursing homes to detention facilities, meatpacking plants and fulfillment centers, the virus exposed the cruelty of these warehouses of efficiency and profit. Then, things got worse. In 2023, super droughts led to mega floods. Locusts carved a path across continents and hyper typhoons drove millions from their homes. COVID-23 raced through storm shelters and refugee camps. Supplies ran out again. Meanwhile, dinosaurs roamed the halls of power, bellowing that more sacrifice was needed. But every time they cranked up that rusty old machine called economic growth, the cloud of sickness and death grew. It goes on a little bit from there. Um, has a happy ending, so definitely check out the whole thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I just want to acknowledge 
Molly Crabapple's genius artwork there and, and the script that was co-written by Opal and Avi. Um, but, you know, really thinking, looking at that now really underlines a point for me. And once again, I'm terrified to see the comments on YouTube, but um, in thinking about this moment uh, of what is happening with these convoys and all of these, you know, Canadian flags everywhere, I, I think that this unveiling and an unveiling not only of existing inequalities, but the roots of those inequalities in our history. And it, it, it strikes me that we cannot see it as unrelated that in 2020, the streets of our cities were full of Black Lives Matter demonstrations or that on Canada Day, the streets of our cities were filled with mourners um, for the more than a thousand children who died, many of them killed inside so-called residential schools. Um, and that Canada Day was canceled in many communities and people um, didn't wave the flag. And that there's something, you know, J Jesse Wente, um, uh wrote, I, I saw a tweet from him today saying that it's not a coincidence that this occurs as more truths of history are revealed, a desire to reassert colonial dominance in the face of actually having to face them and to provide a sense of community where the pandemic has shown there is little. And I think that, I mean, I'm not saying that it's like a conscious backlash against the fact that we have been forced to look at really difficult truths during the pandemic about who makes comfort possible, like who makes it possible for people like me to stay home, um, you know, whose lives were treated as, as, as sacrificial. Um, and the truth of, 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 of whose stolen land our country is on and whose bodies our country is built on. All of that was really hard to look at, but people were starting to look. And now we're in this moment where that outpouring is being replaced by this other kind of, like, I think of them as like kind of doppelganger protests or doppelganger movements. And um, yeah, I think it, it, it's, it's, that's an important context for us to understand this strange moment, this vertiginous moment we're in. Your video seems to agree that we're on the verge of many more pandemics if we don't change the way that we live, essentially. Is that? Yeah, <laughs> um, there, there's no doubt. And, and, that, and, that, and, I, and, and here I think that, you know, what we call for in, in that video are these, the, the, the real investments in what makes a society able to weather shocks, right? That it isn't, you can't put everything on a vaccine mandate, you know? Um, you need to invest in the infrastructure of care and or what we call the, the, the infrastructure of care and repair. Um, and, you know, in so many ways, and, 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 and there've been some great pieces uh, uh, written about this, one co-written by Judy Rebick about, um, you know, the Canada's pandemic response in the, in the early days you know, we did pay people to stay home, and um, but we never really we didn't invest in a community care core. Um, you know, we didn't we we didn't in, invest in outdoor education. We didn't make the big infrastructure investments that would have that would have made it possible to, for people to gather more safely in schools um, or made our hospitals more resilient. It's just all the vaccine, the vaccine, the vaccine, and the vaccine itself has been, the profits have been privatized. And this has created a, an atmosphere that is very ripe for conspiracy theories because people are seeing the huge profits that are being won by a small group of people. It doesn't feel right. So they're looking for explanations. Um, and yeah, we are gonna be seeing more shocks, but that doesn't mean that we need to res respond in the, in the ways that we've been responding. There, there are ways that we can come together in crisis. Oh, thank you. And, and look after each other. My last question. A dual citizen born in Montreal, now returned from New Jersey and welcome home, uh, and resident in British Columbia, you have undoubtedly introduced tens of thousands of young Canadians to progressive environmentalist thought. Bonfire repeatedly underlines the moral contradictions of 
our prime minister, who was green sounding, but also addicted to pipelines. And your leap manifesto caught the eye of Canada's new Democratic Party. Yet when it comes to on fire, I found the central historical metaphors or analogies, the New Deal and the Marshall Plan are drawn from the repertoire of US politics of the 1930s and 1940s. Now, is there a risk that disregarding national specifics and foregrounding US models inadvertently strengthen some of the colonial relationships of which you are so critical? As someone with rare insights into working on both sides of the border, do you think the next left should work harder to adapt its universal message of human survival to the national context in which that message is being articulated? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. Um, and as a writer, you know, we, I work with what I have, you know, I'm not inviting, I'm not, I'm not inventing this from scratch. And so the decision to call it a new deal was, was a decision that was made by the Sunrise Movement and, and, and the squad, uh, particularly Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And, um, you know, it had a lot of traction. The, the call for a Marshall Plan for Planet Earth was actually a call that came from Bolivia. Um, and, and, you know, I was quoting Angelica Navarro, the, Bolivia's um, climate and trade negotiator, uh, in 2009. And, um, you know, as you point out, when we did our own version of this in Canada, we called it the leap. Um, we didn't call it, you know, a Green New Deal or, or, or a Marshall Plan or an industri the new industrial, the Green Industrial Revolution, which is what they call it in the UK. Um, we called it the leap and then we got slammed because we were called Maoists and said that we were, <laughs> but, but we, we weren't modeling on it on the great leap forward. But, 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 but we were very specific when, you know, when we had the gathering that led to the writing of the leap manifesto that we didn't want to appeal to nostalgia. Like we didn't want to appeal to a Canada that never was because a lot of the left, you know, the white left in Canada has sort of fetishized a kind of, um, you know, a, a post-war Canada um, as a sort of the moment that we need to return to and hasn't really rec reckoned with the exclusions and the violences of, of, of that era. Um, uh, you know, at the Japanese internment um, and, and the inherent racism in a lot of these programs. At the same time, <laughs> as I recognize all of that, I also recognize that one of the things that we are most challenged by as we organize in the rubble of neoliberalism is a powerful sense among a lot of people that we uh, that there's something in human nature that makes it impossible for us to do big things together, that we're just too selfish, that we're too this, we're too that. And that's where I think that these, you know, drawing on historical precedents whether it's Canada's own experience during the Second World War, my brother Seth Klein, you know, wrote a terrific book called *The Good War* um, that draws on Canada's history during the Second World War and acknowledges all of the tensions and contradictions in that, but still says, "Look, we need we people need to know that it, that 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 it's been possible to do big things in the in, you know in 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 the not that distant past." which doesn't mean we want to do it exactly the same way, but there's, but there's some utility in that. So I guess my answer is I feel torn because I think that I've seen the way it can resonate to be able to talk about something like the Civilian Conservation Corps, you know, that, that, that hired 2 million young people and planted 2 billion trees, you know, um, and, and built 800 state parks and, you know, did that in the 1930s and just being able to say like that happened, you know, um, and so it isn't human nature that says that we can't do things at that speed and scale again. Um, so I think we do need some, we need, we, we can't completely say there's nothing that we can draw on. There's no, there's, there's, there, there's nothing useful there. Great. Thank you so much for, and uh, now I think we can receive some questions from the audience. Um, so uh, here's the first question from John B. My question for Naomi, how do you feel that neoliberalism has changed or evolved over the past 30 years? Was it, what was it, what is it today that it wasn't in 1992? Huh, that's such an interesting question. Um, so, I mean, I think the history of capitalism is a history of enclosure. 
um, it's it's a history of of bringing uh, um, swaths of life that are outside of the market and enclosing them inside the logic of the market and in the process transforming them because once something is within the logic of the market, um, it, 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 what it needs to do is completely different. So if we think about enclosures of, of, of land in the British countryside in you know, the 1700s or the 1800s, um, it isn't just that a fence is, is, is put around previously communal farmland where um, where, where, where people who lived around that land were able to graze their animals, were able to collect firewood, is that the, the role of that land changed and it now had to yield crops um, and its only role was to maximize productivity for, the, for, the, for, for, for those crops. Um, so it's both enclosed and changed. So I would say that the history of capitalism is that history and the history of neoliberalism is a history of a whole of a new kind of enclosure um, that began with enclosing parts of the state that had been kept outside of the reach of the market, like education and healthcare, and and you know bringing them in. Where we're at now is so radical because what's being enclosed is uh, us and our relationships, right? Mm -hmm. So enclosing human beings within capital is not new because well, that's what slavery is. It's turning free human life into commodity in the most violent way imaginable. What we're seeing with surveillance, what, you know, what Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism or uh, Nick Coldry and Ulysses Mayhas call data colonialism is a, 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 a process of enclosure whereby our friendships, fam, you know, uh, our, our speech, um, this conversation that's happening over Zoom, you know, we would have maybe had in a public hall um, and, it, you know, in a, in a public space. And now it's enclosed in a corporate platform. Um, some people are watching it on Google's platform. We're having it on Zoom. Um, the data from our conversations becomes a raw resource to be extracted. And then the purpose of the conversations change. So the purpose of the conversation for Google um, is not to facilitate us having a conversation. It's to extract the data to drive more engagement on their platforms that they can sell ads. Um, so I think that that's the, that's the radical edge of, of what's happening with neoliberalism. You have that really brilliant analysis of Donald Trump as a brand. And you know his whole family is a brand, and that's, they've sort of elected a brand, right? And that made me really think that one of the most distinctive things about the changes of neoliberalism since the 1990s has just been that that emphasis on branding taken to a kind of psychological imperative for each and every one of us. We're supposed oh, absolutely. To, we're supposed to be branding ourselves all the time. It's like, who? <laughs> it is, as you say, a kind of radical extension of traditional capitalism. Yeah, so that we are supposed to self-commodify and do, um, yeah. Mm. Okay, a second question from Alexander Schwartz. What are your thoughts about Bacon's and Abbott's claim in the new corporation about corporate capitalism creating more emerging diseases and viruses as long as it continues to destroy nature? Um, well, I, I think that the history of, of zoonotic viruses would uh, um, would support that claim. Um, and, you know, there's still debates about the origin of COVID-19. Um, uh, but I think that we do we, we do know that that this is we are as we encroach more and more on wild lands uh, on it, on the homes of animals we have more human animal interfaces and there's more opportunities for viruses to jump from animals to humans absolutely okay melody bryce asks no one is talking about austerity measures that will surely happen once the pandemic is behind us what can be done to prepare to fight against this such a great question <clears throat> And I think that we are, I mean, what we're starting to see a little bit is like um, kind of the uses of overloaded hospitals as a excuse for backdoor kind of privatizations or partial privatizations of healthcare. Um, 
But I think what, what you're referring to is the fact that we've seen some huge spending and we're seeing some inflation and this is the conditions under which some of the most brutal austerity has been imposed in the history of neoliberalism. And so um, we must be prepared for that. We, uh, um, and, uh, you know, I, I think maybe this comes back to why we need a broad-based left. You know, it's not just a climate movement. We need a left. <laughs> um, and we can't all just be in our silos because it's only a very, very broad coalitions that have the ability to really, um, uh, um, you know, stage strikes and, and, and get the attention of, of, of political leaders. And once again, this is why what anybody cheering, you know, a state of emergency for stopping the economy um, that Justin Trudeau is doing is not thinking long term because any kind of you know resistance to neoliberalism would have to impose some kinds of economic costs. It would have to. Um, that, that's the only thing that has ever stopped uh, austerity measures. And so, if we're saying, "Oh, it's okay for our politicians to impose to, to to introduce a state of emergency because people are having a bad effect on the economy," that's a terrifying precedent. We can't allow that to happen. Yeah, I was wondering about your prognostications for the decade to come. As an historian, I can see it working out in that, that people are just so exhausted. Hmm. They're so sick of this. And many of our, are bereaved and are mourning loved ones or have sense of trauma. Um, to me, it doesn't strike me as a likely base for an energetic movement of resistance. But perhaps I'm misreading the evidence. Perhaps there is more hope than I'm. What do you have a, a prediction that you'd like to offer? <laughs> well, you know, if we look at the sort of post-war era, I think that the sense of exhaustion and the sense of having sacrificed and the sense of having been through a lot, um, and 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 having a right to a peace dividend, right? I think we have a right to a pandemic dif <laughs> um, dividend. And I think we need, you know, we need ambitious um, movement leaders who, who, who demand it and inspire us. And I think we need artists to help revive our spirits after this period of, of uh, you know, just trying to weather these shocks alone. And this is where I think we're, we're, we're in uncharted territories. I mean, you're, you, you, you're a historian, I'm not. But I think that um, while certainly humans have gone through great difficulties before, I think the technology enabled isolation of, of, of COVID is, seems to me to be quite unique. I mean, to be two years as separate from one another as possible. Um, and, and, and so my hope is that the thrill of being able to be together <laughs> after such sort of unnatural separation, because we are social beings, we are social animals, will be such that we will be overcome with energy. As, as depleted as we feel right now, we will be energized by being in each other's company. And here is where I think there's a fantastic role for artists to help um, you know, give us the soundtrack and the, the inspiration um, and to, al you know, to alchemize the grief into something energetic. One questioner asks, and a, a very relatedly, do you see fascism creeping into the neoliberal project? A lot of left analysts are talking about imminent fascism and, you know, great debate on the left of, is this classical fascism? How does it differ? How does, so do you, do you see a, a risk of fascism in our present moment? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely I see a risk of eco-fascism. I see I see a risk of like the climate crisis being kind of folded into a narrative around, um, you know, great replacement fears um, and white supremacy, creating a even more toxic cocktail than climate change denial. Um, so you know, if you if it's one thing to deny it, it's another thing to say, okay, it's happening, but we need to fortress our countries and our borders, and maybe they should die. And this is where I think that the COVID um, misinformation and the way you have a kind of the, the sort of wellness worlds converging with the conspiracy and far right worlds is really terrifying because 
um, you'll hear things like, well, I have a great immune system um, and I take care of myself. And so why should I have to sacrifice for all these people who aren't taking care of themselves? Maybe they should die. And th this is a fascist worldview. Um, and so I think, it, frankly, it's, I, I see it spreading quickly and in areas that, that, that are surprising, like, like, like yoga studios, you know, like, mm -hmm. and, and so not all of them, but like, this is what, you know, is, is being called conspirituality. Um, this coming together of the, of the, um, the kind of wellness woo worlds with the far right uh, QAnon world. And it's real. It's really real. Listen, I live on the West coast. Believe me, it's real. <laughs> A question from Anand. How can citizens demand change when the government has been subverted to corporations? <laughs> um, I mean, I think that this is what we've been talking about, right? Um, that 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 this is not new. Our, our governments have been doing the bidding of corporations now for a very long time, um, and and we have found ways to come together and stand up, and if we and out organize our opponents, and we have stopped trade deals before. Um, and we have won huge victories for, uh, for the public good, uh, but there is no substitute for truly broad-based organizing with a willingness um, to take action, right? It isn't just about voicing our opinions. It's actually about in, um, you know, interrupting business as usual, withholding labor. And once again, coming back to the terribly dangerous precedent of saying, if you are hurting the economy, then we get to have all of these special powers because what else is a strike? Mm -hmm. We've reached the hour point and I think that's uh, my experience of Zoom is that's not a bad time to wind up. <laughs> this has been a great evening and a, a wonderful insight into your work. Thank you so much, Naomi Klein, not only for visiting us tonight, but also for doing so much to inspire the coming generation as it strives to save our troubled world. So thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for your fantastic probing questions and for all you do. And thank you all for, for listening. And um, I hope the comments aren't too brutal. <laughs> Take care. Bye.